Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the National Women's Business Council's webinar Wednesday. Today, we are partnering with SBA's Office of Rural Affairs to answer all of your questions surrounding PPP loan forgiveness. My name is Nina Roque, and I serve as the Executive Director of the National Women's Business Council. I'm also joined today by Council Member Rebecca Hamilton, the co-CEO of Badger, she serves on the council's rural subcommittee. We also have an amazing group of speakers here at the Small Business Administration. We have Bill Briggs, the Deputy Associate Administrator from the Office of Capital Access. And from SBA's Office of Rural Affairs, we have Kristen Wellman and Jeff Bass. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. It's gonna to be a really great conversation. So pre-pandemic, we know that women-owned small businesses accounted for 42% of all businesses in this country. That's nearly 13 million. Of those businesses, they employed 9.4 million workers and generated revenue of 1.9 trillion. We also know, unfortunately, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, that female-owned businesses experienced a 25% drop due to this pandemic. Female founders have fought too hard for a true place in this economy to lose those gains now. That's why at the National Women's Business Council, we absolutely remain committed to advocating for this country's women business owners and entrepreneurs. And that's why today's conversation could not be more important or timely. With over 5 million PPP loans approved to date, we are very grateful to have Bill Briggs join us here today on our webinar series to provide a brief overview of SBA's PPP loan forgiveness guidance. We'll then hear a Q&A discussion with Rebecca and Jeff. Rebecca, being a PPP loan recipient herself, will ask Jeff all about the do's and don'ts in applying for PPP loan forgiveness. We have also received and reviewed all of your questions and we will make sure to incorporate those questions in today's Q&A discussion and answer as many of them as possible. If you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about the National Women's Business Council. So the National Women's Business Council is a nonpartisan independent federal advisory committee established in 1988 for the purpose of providing advice and policy recommendations to the President, Congress, and the U.S. Small Business Administration. The council is comprised of 15 members. We have one presidentially appointed chair, Liz Sarah, eight small business owners from across the country, including Rebecca from New Hampshire. We have council members in Iowa, in Idaho, Florida, Texas, Virginia, and Maryland. And we have six representatives of national women's business organizations, many of which I'm sure you all are familiar with, including the Association of Women's Business Centers, the Veneto Project, the Women's President's Organization, the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, the Association of Women in Science, and the Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership at Babson College. For today's conversation, you can follow along with us on Twitter at NWBC using the hashtag Webinar Wednesday. With that, let's get started. I'm very pleased to introduce Bill Briggs, who is now a seasoned guest on the NWBC webinar series. Thanks again, Bill, for joining us. We really appreciate it and take it away, Bill. Thanks, Dina, and, and thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with everybody today. I apologize that my video is not there. Uh, we're having some technical uh, uh, difficulties at SPA headquarters uh, that hopefully will be resolved soon. But um, sometimes that just happens, uh, you know, with, with technology and certainly in a social distancing situation. So uh, we'll hopefully get those fixed. Um, I'm really glad to join here because today's what this subject is is really about is is the, the crux of the whole Paycheck Protection Program. Congress and the administration designed this program so that if small businesses and nonprofits use the uh, the loan proceeds 
for appropriate purposes, primarily paying for the payroll costs of their employees and some re related costs that those loans would be forgiven if um, if the if the small business borrower or, or a nonprofit organization used them in the appropriate manner. In a sense, the loan would act as if a grant. Um, and so this is up to date. If you if you are a borrower right now, you have received a funds from a lender, and then you will apply for forgiveness the same way you applied for a loan. You will work with your lender to do that. So that's the first thing. But then the process is the lender would submit that forgiveness application to SBA for review and hopefully ultimate forgiveness. And the goal of this administration is not to play gotcha, but to make sure that we are, uh, you know, preserving the taxpayer dollars and, and using them judiciously while also doing everything we can to support the nonprofits and small businesses that have been impacted by this uh, COVID situation. But this is the point in forgiveness processes where taxpayer dollars are on the line. And so it's going to take a little bit longer than the forgiveness than the original loan application process sent. So if you kind of remember back in April and Mar in, in April and May, there was kind of this mad rush to get applications in with lenders and to sort of really get uh, get your funds deposited as quickly as possible. The whole goal, everybody's attitude was get the money to struggling small businesses and nonprofits as soon as possible. And so SBA worked really hard to do that in a short amount of time where we did over 14 years worth of loans in, in less than 14 days. Um, and then by after 30 days, we had approved over half a trillion dollars worth of loans. Now the forgiveness process is a little bit longer and more steady process in that once you submit an application to a lender, the lender has 60 days to review with it, approve the documentation, make sure everything is order, and then to make a, a forgiveness determination to submit to SBA. SBA then has 90 days to review that documentation and, and ultimately we make a decision on the forgiveness and ultimately then reimburse the lender for the cost of funds that were given to the, to the small business borrower. So if you're a borrower, the most important thing you need to do and the most important resource you need is to immediately kind of work with your lender, understand how your lender is approaching the forgiveness process, and then, you know, as, as need be, work through the forgiveness forms and documentation, which your lender has. They're also available on sba.gov slash PPP. Uh, and then you can go through that process with your lender. Your lender will then have the ability once they submit it to SBA to see where that loan is in the review process or the forgiveness application is, and then ultimately uh, be able to inform you of the forgiveness decisions and so forth. Um, secondly, if your lender sometimes is busy or hard to reach of, there are tremendous resources in SBA district offices, as well as our SBA resource partners, which include small business development centers and other institutions around the country. All of those institutions can be found near, uh, or institutions that are near you, can be found at sba.gov slash local dash assistance. So again, the two links I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about today is sba.gov slash PPP to find the forgiveness forms, and then sba.gov slash local dash assistance to find SBA resources near you if you have further questions about forgiveness. Finally, the one thing I want to remind everybody is that just as the COVID situation is an evolving situation, so too is the Paycheck Protection Program. Congress is out right now, but they may come back in September and adjust the rules of the program to make forgiveness easier for borrowers. So it's important to stay abreast of the situation and continue to work with your lenders who have the best information about forgiveness, including any updates that Congress will make. Finally, I just wanna state that my comments are as effective as today, noting that if you're listening to this in a few weeks or something in September, um, that these comments may have been no longer relevant. So it's really important to work with your lender to make sure you have the most up-to-date information about the forgiveness uh, process and what you should do as a borrower. Again, I wanna thank both the Office of Rural Affairs for their leadership in this effort, as well as the National Women's Business Council for their continued great work and continued focus on uh, women's business issues and small business issues as it relates to the Paycheck Protection Program. Thanks, Nina. Thank you so much, Bill. We really appreciate that. And we will make sure to provide both of the links that you just mentioned in the Q&A so all of the participants can hear and can see and have that information as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Hamilton. As I mentioned, she's the co-CEO of Badger in Gilsom, New Hampshire. She also serves on the council's rural subcommittee, and she is a passionate advocate for child care reform, among other issues. So thank you, Rebecca, for your leadership, and we look forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you, Nina. And it's an honor to be representing the National Women's Business Council and all the work that we do, particularly in the work that we do in the rural subcommittee. Uh, that's something that is near and dear to my heart because I live in a rural area. My business is actually in a town of 817 people in rural New Hampshire. And so we personally experience a lot of the things that uh, the women that we speak to throughout the country are experiencing right now as well. And in particular, uh, during this past spring and summer during the pandemic, uh, we experience um, a significant loss in our business and we're able to come through that through getting the PPP loan. So this webinar in particular is also something that I'm really very interested to hear more about what's happening and the process for the forgiveness and, and really just uh, learning as much as I can from our guests here from the SBA. I actually have two businesses. So I have Badger, which is a manufacturer, as I said, in rural New Hampshire, and we have about 100 employees. And I also have a restaurant which is in the next test the town over. And so we were experiencing the pandemic in kind of two different ways. And in both cases, we were able to apply for and receive the PPP loan. So in the case of my restaurant, when New Hampshire first implemented the stay at home order, we had to close our doors on day one and lay off uh, all of our employees, about 20 employees. And uh, it was only through getting the PPP loan about a couple, few weeks later, I think it was less than a month later, that we were able to hire our staff back and start uh, operating really creatively, finding different ways to work with anything from takeout to meals that people could take home uh, when they weren't able to leave their houses to selling groceries out of the restaurant. And so uh, the PPP loan was critical in us getting back on our feet. And so we actually now have all of our employees back working at the restaurant. We have full indoor and outdoor, and we're in a very positive, solid place right now. This is also not uh, the the end of, of the pandemic. And so we're we're really looking for for what what's going to come next. But we were able to get through this first portion because of that. And in the case of my manufacturing business, which is primarily a sunscreen business, seasonal business, uh, we saw a 40% drop in sales in April and a 30% drop in sales in May. And we were able to maintain all of our staff without any layoffs through getting the PPP loan. And so we're now in a place where we're back up to uh, a growth in sales and in a very good place going into the fall. But again, that was something that was really critical in, in both cases. So I'm here kind of alongside all of the different uh, people who are listening into this webinar, looking forward to learning more. So I'm, I'm very happy to introduce both Kristen and Jeff. Uh, first, Kristen Wellman. Uh, she is in the Office of Rural Affairs, specializes in communications and marketing with the Small Business Administration's Office of Rural Affairs. Prior to this role, she served as press secretary for South Dakota Governor Christy Nome and as communications staffer on Capitol Hill. Within the rural affairs team, Kristen works to amplify the successes of the SBA programs and partners with media and industry experts to expand opportunities for small businesses and entrepreneurs in rural communities across the nations. So welcome, Kristen. Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. It's so encouraging to hear um, your story and the stories of businesses like yours. That's exactly what our team has been working um, really hard over the last few months to really uh, get resources to businesses that without the PPP loan wouldn't, may not have made it through the pandemic. So it's really encouraging to hear that. And um, hopefully we'll hear more stories of other people uh, on the line too, who are able to use this uh, webinar to help their business, especially through the forgiveness process. And so um, just really quickly, um, like Rebecca said, I'm from the Office of Rural Affairs um, and our team is just uniquely positioned to really zoom into the issues facing rural, rural businesses across the nation. Um, so I'm from a rural community. The people on our team are all from rural communities. And so we know what it's like to um, 
how, how every business in a small town really impacts the community and the community's economy. And so we're really working to get resources and opportunities to rural businesses so that they can thrive in every way possible. Um, and so we would love to work, uh, if, you're, if you own a business on this line, you know, we'd love to work with you to make sure that you have access to financial assistance to the SBA's lending programs, whether that's just to stay afloat through the pandemic um, or to expand your business and your operation in the coming years. Um, we would love to work with you and make sure that you have the resources that you need um, to thrive. Uh, we're also working to provide assistance um, to rural small businesses uh, in areas like to get you information about areas like exporting or about hub zones or other um, opportunities available through both the SBA and other government agencies. And we're also uh, really trying to engage with industry leaders to develop a network that we can tie rural businesses into just to make sure that um, you have access to uh, various grant programs or expansion opportunities or anything um, that would just really help your business and in helping your businesses also help your communities. So we're excited to talk with you today about PPP forgiveness, and we're also excited to work with um, your businesses in the future um, as we work to serve our rural communities. Thank you so much, Kristen. Yeah, we really appreciate that. We really appreciate uh, the partnership with the Office of Rural Affairs. Jeff, I don't know if you want to kind of share a little bit about your experience, and then we can begin with the Q&A. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for um, allowing us to, to do this for you today and to be part of this. I came um, I come from a banking background, uh, a little over 27 years in commercial lending and commercial banking, and um, most all kinds of different um, businesses. I've done business lending, real estate lending, um, running a national team. And over the course of my banking career, I've been involved with SBA lending, kind of three different iterations, some of which involved actually establishing a, a lending platform for the banks I was at in the SBA realm. So um, it's it's been kind of fun to kind of come back around to the SBA world again in the small business environment. Uh, I've always kind of looked at small business and SBA lending as of all the different kind of business groups and types of um, clients we've had as the ones that bring the most passion to the table and it, it kind of gives you the most gratitude when you're involved with it. So, um, and always have had an appreciation for the contributions that the small businesses make in so many ways. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming from and joined the SBA just a couple months ago uh, to be with the Office of Rural Affairs. Oh, great. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to have you here and I'm excited to pick your brain and see what kind of information we can share with everyone. So to start off the conversation, could you just give us a little bit of the, the groundwork, what the general stats are, uh, who's received the loan so far, how many people, businesses? Sure. Well, we've had uh, a little over uh, 5.2 million of loans as it shows on the slide. So that's essentially a, a loan to, uh, every one of those is a loan to an entity of some sort. Uh, some have been affiliated, uh, so it might be a, a number of affiliates to, um, under under one kind of common ownership, but those are um, distinct businesses receiving a loan. And then you've got over 525 billion of actual funding that's spread across those loans. And interestingly, the average loan size is uh, a little over 100,000, about 101,000. So it really is, uh, while you hear about the larger loans being made, uh, the average loan size of 101,000 is, is obviously a small business loan. Um, so um, that's that's kind of the big stats on, on the program. Yeah, I think for, for both my businesses, one of them was just under 100,000 and the other one was around 300,000. So that's in line for, I think, a lot of rural businesses in particular. Do you have information on how rural businesses specifically fared or during this time? Now, this was interesting. Um, as you can see that from the slide, the rural areas received a little over 15% of the total PPP uh, loan dollar volume. I, th I think what was um, unprecedented with this type of program was that the, the extension of the SBA programs to the rural communities uh, was done in such a, a, a significant way because ordinarily some of the programming that we offer doesn't always reach to or isn't available for some of the folks in the rural industries. And so uh, from the start, the program included important rural industries such as farmers, ranchers, ag producers, 
which was unique. Um, also extended to nonprofits, so that would involve all forms of different nonprofits, in, including uh, uh, small town um, uh, religious organizations and and other types of um, nonprofit entities providing services to to the rural community. Um, and then the SBA eventually extended eligibility um, for ag producers to also apply for idle loans, um, which is not part of this discussion so much, but that was an important piece that came out. And then our team actually worked to provide information to electric co-ops and telephone co-ops after the program expanded to make them eligible. And so that ended up extending assistance to essential services like electricians and internet service providers. So much more um, all encompassing than, than, than ever before. And, and what happens to the remaining funds? Uh, I guess the question is twofold. What happens to remaining funds if there are funds left over and can a business apply twice? So the remaining funds, the, the program was extended um, until August 8th, and then uh, any extension of the program beyond August 8th would have to be uh, dealt with as part of a, a new appropriation or authorization by Congress. So we're kind of waiting on that. We're, we're eager to see that start again. Uh, but right now, no, there's about 100 and I think a little over 130 billion left over that was not utilized um, as of the close of business on August 8th. So. And then uh, as far as using, we're getting a, a second PPP loan. Again, that is something that is um, certainly being discussed um, on Capitol Hill. I think some of the, what we're hearing is that it would be targeted to the most uh, impacted businesses. There might be some revenue testing. Those that are more severely impacted would have that opportunity. So we're, we're waiting for that too. So I think Badger and also my restaurant are right now in the process of starting to look for where to apply for forgiveness. Uh, could you speak to a little bit about where where a business might go in order to go through that process? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, as, as Bill talked about in the opening, there uh, all the information is really readily available in terms of forms and guidance. It's there's a lot there. So one must be patient when you start kind of navigating through it, but you can either go to the Treasury website or the SBA website um, to look at the information. But what we always recommend, like Bill said, is, is to really start with your lender because the ultimately, uh, just as when you receive, applied for and receive the PPA, PPP loan funding, that same lender is one that's going to process your forgiveness for you and make that determination. So really want to work closely with your lender um, but it doesn't hurt um, to familiarize yourself with the with the forms and we're going to talk a little bit about that, of course, in just a little bit, but um, always starting with the lender is, is the first step. Is the process the same if you're a sole proprietor as for another type of business and applying for forgiveness? Well, the um, in terms of like eligible expenses and things, um, it's, it's the same for any particular entity. Uh, what's nice about a sole proprietor is that they're able to um, be able to use the, um, the straightforward 3508 easy form. Um, but in terms of eligibility and expenses, um, again, still going through their lender that they received the loan from, um, but they'll find it to be a much more simplified process. And, and the loan process is now extended. You can get a PPP loan if you've not yet applied for it because there's additional funds. Uh, no, that would have to be authorized by Congress. So right now um, there is no additional PPP funding at this point. So what kind of documentation is necessary at this point in order to apply for the forgiveness? So the documentation uh, is basically this is and this is good if you if you look at either of those websites we mentioned and you were to take a look at the um, the application instruction form. There's one for the 3508 and the 3508 easy form, but you're basically assembling the, the documentation that would support the expenses that you're going to be applying for forgiveness. So it, it's broken down into two primary um, buckets, if you will. The first one is uh, payroll related expenses, and then the second category would be non-payroll eligible expenses. And um, those are basically outlined uh, payroll expenses will actually include cash compensation and then non-cash compensation and then eligible uh, non-payroll costs are, are specified too, which is basically a mortgage and rent obligations and utility payments. And we have a, a question from the audience, which is uh, they had heard that if the loan was under 100,000, it's automatically forgiven. Is that true? 
No, not at this point. No. <laughs> uh, well, again, you have to go through the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. Like ask. Yeah, and, and that's what we kind of say on this slide as far as the basic advice is that we say borrowers should proceed with running the numbers, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But you know, when when Bill talked about, and, and we're all, and you know, there's a lot of anticipation that some threshold would be set so that that would be a simplified forgiveness process. Um, but the fact of the matter is that even if that's done um, and you and you sign that form that attests that you that you are eligible, you still have the what we're seeing so far that's being proposed is you're still going to have to have your paperwork to support it. But so you still have to it's, it is time to take a look at the forms and to start what we call running the numbers. A couple other questions that came from the audience. Uh, one is if you take on an investor during this time after you've gotten the PPP loan, how does that impact the eligibility for forgiveness? So the one thing that we don't have any additional clarity on right now is, is if you have changes in ownership uh, or if you're wanting to sell your company. What, what we do know is that it, it, the sale of a company, uh, the sale of the assets of a company, uh, those things should be communicated ahead of time to your lender and your lender actually needs to get approval from the SBA. Um, some of those rules fall under um, this. This is technically under the 7A program. So some of those rules fall under that, that programming. So things that are going to have an impact, you know, if you kind of think about it, your lender wouldn't want you to make a change in ownership without letting them know. And it's the same way with the SBA. So anything that you're anticipating doing, if somebody's investing into your company, uh, that, that's that's a bit different than um, than selling. But if there's a if there's a substantial change in ownership, um, you, you'll want to address that with your lender. Okay. Yeah. Questions. Kind of throwing a little curveball here. Uh, what happens if you are not able to rehire your full staff and you have a PPP loan? Right. That's a great question. Um, what I would uh, point people to, it, there's there's a, there's a there's guidance on it, but this is one of the critical areas of trying to preserve your forgiveness amount and not losing forgiveness if you can if you can help it. So on, on page five of the form 3508, it actually walks you through um, what we call FTE reduction exceptions and then also safe harbors. Now, one thing I should point out, it can be a little confusing when you fill out an app, the application, when you look at what you did when you got set up with this, you were you were reporting the number of employees you had. And you'll notice on the form in the beginning, it says how many employees did you have before it? And then how many employees do you have now? And that's important because the SBA wants to understand how the impact has been there for employees. But when you are dealing with your actual forgiveness application, we're now focusing what we call full time equivalent. So it's not an employee count, but it's a full time equivalent assessment. So, you know, part time employees add up to a certain amount. If somebody works overtime, there's still only one employee. So there's all these things you have to look at, but you're looking at FTE. So what the SBA allows for here in, in the program rules is that um, there's two safe harbors that could allow you to not have to have that impact your forgiveness. And one is that um, if you're unable to hire somebody back, so that's what this question is kind of about. And, and basically there's, um, three kind of, actually I made a mistake here, it's actually FTED an exception, but it's all on page five of this form. If you've made a good faith written offer to rehire them and they refuse, now that, that offer to rehire needs to be at the same wages and the same hours. So if you are wanting to rehire them at 25 or 50 percent of their pay, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't qualify. But if you're, if you're rehiring them for what they were doing before, the same, same pay and same hours, and they refuse and you can and you document it then you don't have to count that as a loss of an FTE um, and and then um, so if they reject it you can also have a situation in which um, they voluntarily resigned or they were fired for cause and that also uh, would not a, a, a account against you so those are what we call exceptions and then the safe harbors are you may not have been able to hire people because your business was restricted from doing so because of government imposed limitations on being able to even operate. Uh, so that's one. And then if you've, and this kind of, we'll talk about maybe in how long or what's the right time to file, but if you might have to decide 
how long to wait to apply because if you can bring them back before you apply or before the end of the covered period, then that also would not count against you. So um, I think what probably the, the question centered on is people that won't come back or you can't bring them back. One thing to keep in mind too is that if you, you might lose an employee, but you might have hired somebody else and you're looking at the total FTEs compared to what you started with. So just because you've lost a couple of employees, if you've hired others, that would that could actually compensate and your FTEs wouldn't change, for example. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Well, why don't we go into that next question about when to apply for the forgiveness? Sure. Um, well, that is a big question. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, of course, it depends. Um, but what on several factors. We talked um, already a bit about this addi additional legislation that might come about. So as a business operator, they might be looking at a situation where they're like, well, um, first of all, maybe at this less than $150,000 threshold, a simplified process. What I, I what we kind of want to keep echoing here, though, is that it's being labeled as, as a streamlined forgiveness, but not what we would. Sometimes the terminology is being used as automatic or turning it into a grant. Now, we, Congress could change that, but what we're seeing so far is that you're still going to need to certify or attest that you that you were eligible, and you'll you'll have to um, what we say run the numbers, and and in some in some instances you're you're going to end up kind of the borrower's going to end up doing the work that they ordinarily would do to submit an application. I kind of liken it to if you want to kind of tuck it under your pillow at night and sleep well, you want to make sure that when you're going to sign off and attest. That, that we're being honest and we've run the numbers and we know that we can do that to the best of our ability, say that. And for, you're gonna to have to retain those, those documents, even if it's just an attestation. And the other thing is that the SBA is focused on reviewing all loans above 2 million, but they do still have the right to look at any loan that is part of the PPP program. Um, that 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 for some reason they they deem as as needing to be reviewed. So for those reasons, we think it's wise to still be looking at what you actually qualify for. Um, and then you know some might be thinking, well, it, I if I'm looking for more dollars, maybe a second PPP loan. Um, there could be a reason why you, we don't have any idea how that might look. If you've started the forgiveness or you want to get the first one forgiven, but you're going to get a second one, that would all be addressed if that kind of legislation came out. And then some people might um, be looking for a little more guidance because they've got a business with some circumstances that they don't maybe think is fully addressed in the guidance so far. And then I have some things under here, what we call status of the borrower. So I, I put these things in like, what financial shape is the business in? What are the business conditions? Um, Rebecca, you talked about your situation where in, in two different businesses, you had distinctly different kinds of businesses, the experiences they went through uh, so far in this um, pandemic. And so some some business owners that we're talking to here today might find things are better or the same or getting worse. And depending upon what's happening in the business, it's going to affect how they're able to retain people and how they're able to pay people, which those things can affect the forgiveness amount. So some might find that I think I might want to accelerate applying because I'm in good shape, but I don't know what's going to happen next. Or others might say, you know, I'm going to need to use a little more of the covered period to see if I can get everybody, get this thing back in shape a little more to better qualify for forgiveness. So those things can impact. The other thing is, um, has the borrower used all the loan proceeds for which they request forgiveness? I think we had a question on that too. Somebody was asking about, well, I haven't used all my money. Um, and what we're really focusing on is, have you and do you anticipate that you've used all of the money that you're actually going to request forgiveness for. So if you got a $150,000 PPP loan and it got wired into you and, and funded and you've only used 120, um, hopefully the other 30 is still in the bank account, but it, you would be applying for the things that you're eligible to apply for um, and for forgiveness that is. And right now, the way the program works is you can only apply for forgiveness once. So that's why you want to kind of get it right the first time because there's really just one time that you apply. And that's why the, uh, you'll see it kind of peppered throughout the, the guidance documents that just don't, don't hurry to apply for forgiveness if you haven't used all your funds yet. Um, and then 
I, I point out here, it's kind of running the numbers again. Has the, has the small business operator calculated their forgiveness amount? Have they started kind of looking at where their situation fits in with how much forgiveness they're going to get at this point? And um, are they comfortable to proceed? And then also, is your, is your lender ready? Like Bill said, we've seen, we have some lenders that are actively starting to submit applications. There's a number of lenders that are waiting for different reasons, um, maybe because they're looking for um, some legislation to come out, or they're also just getting familiar with the portal. So um, you, you, you have to go through your lender. So until they're ready, you wouldn't be able to apply. But that's who you always want to check in with. I would sum it up as it says at the bottom of the slide, you really are trying to maximize your forgiveness at the right time. So there's eligible expenses, but the reality is, is you'd started off applying for a loan, you've got X amount of money, and then and then events happen, and the real world happens to your business for the next few months. And then we kind of come out the other side in this stage of the pandemic and you go, where do I stand? And that's what you want to kind of assess. Uh, one of the questions from the audience is what happens if my business closed or is not able to continue running during this process? Will the PPP loan be forgiven still? So, um, that, that, that we've had that question a, a few times and, and, and that is what I kind of talk about the, the reality of what's going on out there. So what you want to do is, um, again, you, you have to work with your lender to address that, but in the guidance, it's obviously doesn't really talk a lot about that, right? There's not specific guidance that says what happens if your business is closed. The focus is entirely on running the numbers and doing the paperwork and see where everything stands. So um, some of the things that are, would probably be brought to bear on that would be um, if, if, you're, if, if your business, the, the trick here is that a business might have closed just because business, business conditions in that particular sector in which they operated or that impacted their business were so severe that they just simply couldn't operate. That's what we're seeing happening in a lot of instances. Um, but it could be combined with the fact that um, um, CDC guidance and the things that the governments needed, to, the government needed to put in place, local and state and federal, um, impacted them. And, and that would be something that would impact their ability to bring people back. So um, again, this is, um, this is not a gotcha type program as Bill alluded to in the beginning. Just run the numbers and if there's if there's not a business left, um, it, it it is an unsecured, unguaranteed loan. What you don't want to be have happen to you as a business operator though, is you're still going to be having to attest and certify to things. And so you just have to be real honest and clean about what you're presenting to the SBA and if that's the case, you don't have anything to fear, but we want to be straightforward about what's going on with the business and where it stands with the eligibility. Can you explain that? Well, again, if, if you take a look at um, when, when somebody has an opportunity, if you look at the, um, the attestation that you see right now, now we don't know what might come out of Congress, but there's um, there's a list of items that are signed off and it talks about that I've, I've used these for eligible items. It actually talks about the specific eligible items. I haven't used them for unauthorized purposes. So this is what you're attesting to. This is what I mean. I don't, I don't mean to say anybody's gonna be dishonest. I just mean you wanna make sure that when you answer these questions and check these boxes and initial them on the application that you can back that up. And if that's been done and the business is having to close, then there's nothing else the owner could do. And so you just simply still apply for forgiveness of the loan. Yeah. Okay. So whether the business is open, doing well, still crippled or closed, um, there's still a forgiveness process to apply for. And who triggers the forgiveness process? Is that something that a business determines when they're ready or will a bank or a lender determine when they're ready? Or is it kind of a combination between both? Well, um, so I think one good thing is we're not suggesting anybody needs to either hurry up or wait too long because it really is dependent upon the, the conditions and the situation with the business. But um, that's why um, in the Flexibility Act that was passed, the SBA um, kind of changed the deferral of the payments. So now you don't have to make a payment on, on your SBA loan, on the PPP loan, until the earlier of 
10 months after the expiration of your covered period or when the SBA actually remits the repayment dollars or the, the amount of forgiveness. So if you think about that, like Bill talked about, when you, at the point in which you submit your application, the lender has two months and the SBA has three months. So there's five, not that it would take that long, but there's up to five months of the decisioning on that. And then the SBA would remit at some point between your application date and up to five months. And when that happens, then you would start, have, if there was leftover money that had to be paid, that would be when you would structure the, the, the payments with your bank to pay the loan off by the time the loan matures. Um, if you don't do anything um, and you're going to elect a 24 week covered period, then you've got 10 months after that 24 week period to actually apply. So for the businesses that are still trying to figure it out, there's no pressure to apply right away at all. You have plenty of time. We're just saying it's good to start looking at the numbers because there could be a number of cases in which it's perfectly fine and a good idea to apply sooner than later. So would you say that the ideal is to uh, kind of look at the numbers on an ongoing fashion and when you feel that you are in a place where you're ready to apply for forgiveness and you have everything in, in place, then do it at, as, as soon as you're ready. So don't wait longer, but don't do it before you're ready. That's right. That's right. And I mean, obviously, the lender has to be ready to that's not going to take that much longer. We, we know there's a there's a there's a number of lenders, even some of the large lenders that are still not quite ready to accept applications, but they're close and everybody's lenders are building their 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 they've got to get their systems in place to be able to do this. But as Bill talked about in the beginning, um, the effort in the beginning to get the dollars out fast in an emergency setting to businesses. This is a different thing now. It's we don't want people to be frustrated, and, and, but we want people to know that, th that there's going to be a lot more time allowed to process forgiveness because it's it's the money is out. That was the most important thing. Dealing with the forgiveness over time so that everybody can get it right is 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 what's being allowed for in the um, in the in the policy. So there's there's plenty of time to do it. But yeah, paying attention to where you're at, how you're paying your employees. When we get into kind of the basic criteria, I can touch on that. But that's that's what you where where do you stand, both as how is your business doing, and how are you with how you've spent the PPP money, what you've spent it on, and and just testing the numbers to see how much forgiveness you think you've got coming already. Okay, that makes sense. Can you speak a little bit about the forgiveness reduction criteria? Sure. Um, so on this um, on this slide, we this is not the only criteria, but we just wanted to highlight the key ones that can be most impactful on your forgiveness. Um, and obviously, the first two um, uh, are are ones in which there's a uh, it takes a little bit of math and a little bit of work to to try to figure this out. But we talked a little bit about the FTE retainage, and that's again not employees, but your full time equivalents. So that's where you're really trying to look and see where the business is now. Um, if you're thinking about applying for forgiveness sooner than later, um, how have you done with being able to, to keep the FTE uh, number the same as it was going into the loan? Um, and then you've got the salaries and wages reductions. And, and that can, that's what I like to highlight here, it could get a little confusing, but the FTE retainage and the salary and wages reduction, that's done, the salary and wages is done per employee. FTD is an aggregate. Uh, those are separate, and distinct calculations, so they're they're not mixed. Um, they're not mixed. The SBA doesn't want it to hurt anybody or help anybody with those calculations when it comes to the forgiveness. So bear that in mind. And one thing about the salary and wage reductions is, um, uh, again, it has a safe harbor that says that if you would restore, it's it's each employee that's still working for you, if you have reduced their wages or salaries by more than 25 percent then that can cause a reduction in your forgiveness if you're able to restore that on each employee to at least no more than 25 percent reduction by the application date or the end of the covered period whichever comes first then, you, then that's a safe harbor for you meaning you won't be penalized um, one thing to bear in mind is if a person if a business applies for the forgiveness before the end of their covered period so maybe you've elected a 24 week covered period and it doesn't come up until maybe November or October and you're thinking about applying now. Um, if 
any of those wages for your employees are over the 25% reduction, you do have to account for that over the entire covered period. Meaning if you're 12 or 14 weeks into it, you'll actually have to allow for those, you'll have to calculate those reduction of wages over 25% over the entire 24 week period. So just some things to look out for. It's, it's all in the documents, but um, as they kind of say, the devil's in the detail sometimes. Um, the other one is eligible payroll. Uh, we just had a, a, a an IFR come out a couple days ago regarding owner compensation under 5%, but um, we'll probably get more guidance on some of these things. But for owners, that's where the rules get adjusted a little bit. And the rationale for this was that the SBA and the Treasury didn't want excess compensation to go to owner employees um, as kind of a windfall as part of the program. So there are limitations in there, and it does depend upon which type of entity it could be a partnership, corporation, C Corp, S Corp. All those things kind of affect that calculation a little bit for, for owner compensation. Uh, and the other big one is the 60% payroll expense threshold. Um, basically, to the extent that it's underneath 60%, that'll affect the percentage of the, of the forgiveness of your loan. Um, and then looking at your non-payroll expenses too. The last thing, I think we had some questions on idle in there too. Um, yeah, we did earlier. Okay. Um, so, I just have uh, a clarification on this and we can go into that. Okay. Uh, a number of people are asking about what the 24 week period is and if you could clarify a little bit more on that. Right. So the SBA uses the terminology covered period and there's also a term called al alternate covered period. But the, the covered period um, would start from the time your loan is uh, funded. So uh, generally, I think the lenders have just funded all of the loan at once, but if they funded in a few stages, they have to get it all funded by 10 days. It's, it's the first funding date. And that's when your covered period would start. Um, and that is really the, the marker for, um, you know, things that you're trying to determine if they're eligible, paid or incurred during that covered period. And so you also have the opportunity for the payroll aspect of it to choose what they call they call it an, an alternative covered period and that's for businesses that pay people um, every other week or more often if you pay twice a month or less often you don't get to use the alternative covered period so though and, and the alternative covered period would only just shift by like a week or so for non-payroll expenses you would still use the covered period but that's that's essentially the time period over which your eligible expenses um, would be used. Okay. Uh, and you wanted to go on to answer the questions around the EIDL. I think there's a question around how that uh, interacts with the PPP loan, if you get both of them. Right. Uh, so the the idle loan is, um, you know, and I don't have a lot of commentary on the idle loan itself. This today, but the idle loan and the PPP loan are, are separate. The, the idle loan is, is generally used, it has a different purposes. Um, the PPP was very specific about payroll and certain specific non-payroll expenses. The idle loan is, is more available to be able to use for working capital and other things that the business needs to function. So really, from a paperwork standpoint, you're just wanting to show that your uses of your idle loan and your uses of your PPP loan were appropriate, that they, they weren't mixed, if you will. The idle advance, which is from anywhere from one to 10,000, the idle advance um, is something that uh, was built in, the discussion of how it relates to a PPP loan was part of the original CARES Act. And I, I know there's been some confusion about it, but the idle advance is actually deducted from the forgiveness amount when, when that's done. And, and you don't actually fill that out on your app. You, you show your idle advance in your application and, and your and your idle um, loan, but um, you don't, um, you will notice when you see it, that there's not a calculation of taking out the idle advance at the very end of the, uh, uh, the application where you put all your numbers in. That's just something that's done by the SBA with the lender. So as an example, if you have a $100,000 SBA loan, um, a PPP loan, excuse me, and you had a $10,000 advance from for from idle what they would do is and and, and let's assume that of the hundred thousand dollar ppp loan it was all forgivable 
So what they would do is it would be all forgivable, but when they remit it, it would be 100,000 back to the bank to pay off the loan minus 10,000. So there would be a $10,000 uh, leftover amount that you would owe under the PPP loan. And then the bank, the lender and the borrower would then sit down and craft a repayment schedule for that. If the, the borrower could choose to pay that off or if they were unable to, they would structure a payment schedule uh, to pay that off. Yeah. Is PPP loan taxable income? No, the, the PPP loan itself um, is not. Um, and this is this is an area where we, we, we can't comment a whole lot more because it's basically an IRS issue. Uh, but um, and, and I know people, the one big topic out there is that if I all these expenses that I would get in, uh, taken care of with my PPP loan so far are still not considered deductible expenses on your tax return that you would do for this year. And um, that will actually have to be something that um, Congress would legislate to change or the IRS would change. But the IRS has taken the interpretation at the moment that um, that the expenses that you're able to get taken care of with a forgivable PPP loan would not be deductible. So we'll have to see what they do or what Congress might do to address that. But the actual dollars that you get are not treated as um, as, as taxable. So, so there is another value to waiting on going through forgiveness because it sounds like there's still things that are up in the air that might change. Yeah, I mean, um, forgiveness right. from the standpoint of the loan itself. Um, I mean, for for example, if somebody had a, I, was, I saw one article, but if you had like a $250,000 loan and they were calculating that their tax impact, if nothing changed, might be like $70,000 that they would have to pay next year on this year's income of so it, it's that's a whole other thing with your financial advisors and your and, and the tax and, and, and your um, way you file your tax returns because it could also be that the business might have so many losses that year that right that they wouldn't actually have to pay a tax but you know the forgiveness is still something that's going to be important to want to follow through with and the tax impact will either be there or it won't depending upon what congress does or um, what the irs does okay well, I have three more questions from the audience and three minutes. So let's see if we can get through these ones really quickly and end on time. Uh, one question is, uh, you have mentioned utilities are covered. Would new computers or capital expenses be covered? Those are not. Okay. Can your payroll be 100% of the PPP loan? Absolutely. Okay. And the last question is, what paperwork is needed for uh, owner compensation? Is that if someone wanted to use the PPP loan for that? Uh, so there's a lot of detail. It's, there's a lot of guidance on it. It does depend on their entity structure. So that might be something we could follow up with afterwards. I'd be happy to give them some specific guidance if you'd like. Um, and or at least in a general way, point them to the right um, IFRs and guidance on that in the right part of the application. I might just also say, um, I use this expression, look for the low hanging fruit. So if you've got 100% of payroll that'll cover that, it, then you don't have to put all the other things together like utilities, but look for the things that really qualify well that fit in with the guidance nicely. If you get into some of these other little esoteric things that don't have clear guidance, if you have to use it, then you'll work with your lender or you can ask like Bill referred to for the resources to kind of try to find out and you'll see more guidance come out, but low hanging fruit, you know, Look for the stuff that really qualifies more easily. And if you've got enough of that, don't worry about the other things. OK, uh, and one last question for me before we wrap up in the last couple minutes is what do you see coming down the pike in terms of future legislation? Is there anything major we should be looking out for? I think um, there's what, what we sense is there's certainly a desire to do something. Obviously, um, there's a lot going on and we have to wait for um, you know Congress to come back and, and even while they're um, on recess there's still a lot of conversation going on it's obviously even harder for the folks on Capitol Hill because in, in, a, in a virtual social distance world it gets more complicated to have these conversations and do things but there's a desire out there we see um, what it's going to look like um, altogether is, is really hard to tell but there's a desire to bring back some more funding of some sort it's probably going to I think what they want to, what they're, I think what they're trying to do is what we had in the beginning is different than what we have now. So what is it going to take for the next several months or period of time 
to address the needs that are out there. And I think that's 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 the task that they have, and it's not an easy one, but I think there's a desire to bring some of that forth and um, you know, really limit, mitigate the economic um, damage that, that could still happen. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we still have a, a long road ahead, so uh, I appreciate all the work that the SBA is doing and continues to do. So thank you for being here today and answering the questions. I think this sort of webinar is particularly important in rural areas as an opportunity to disseminate information when it would otherwise be very difficult. So I'm going to pass it over to Nina to wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both so much. That was honestly a great conversation. And Rebecca, I think you were the perfect person to ask those questions. And Jeff, you were the perfect person to deliver your expertise. So we really appreciate it. And I think, Rebecca, your last question really gets to the fact that we need to be already planning a follow up for when we receive that additional guidance or when any of the guidance changes. So we'll definitely be in touch about that. I want to thank um, Kristen and Bill as well, our other two speakers. We really appreciate your time and joining us on today's webinar. Also want to say a big thank you to the NWBC team, especially Cameron and Anna. Also, of course, Ashley and Sandra as well. And of course, to the entire um, Office of Rural Affairs team, especially Dan Norberg and Renee Bender. Um, a recording of today's conversation, I know we received a lot of questions about this, will be on our website, nwbc.gov, as well as the PowerPoint slides. You'll also see Jeff's contact information as, as well on the slide. So if you have any follow-up questions, you can definitely email Jeff, but we will also be sending a lot of those answers on a follow-up email as well. As far as our webinar Wednesday series, we'll kind of be on a little bit of a hiatus here until October as we focus on our September 29th public meeting. This meeting will be virtual and we absolutely invite you all to attend virtually. And we encourage you all to submit public comments on what are the challenges, what are the opportunities that as business owners, as entrepreneurs, you all are facing. So that will be September 29th. Um, if you follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, the invitation will be up there within the next week or so. So definitely um, plan to attend and join us and submit a public comment. So we look forward to keeping in touch with all of you. Thank you again for joining and we will see you at our next public meeting. Thank you.